do what you say you're going to do in the time frame you say you're going to do it every single time. And the reason why that will get you to love yourself is because you now have proof that you keep your word to yourself. Welcome, everybody, to The Chris Harder Show, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success, knowing that when good people like you make good money, they can then do great things. My name is Chris Harder, and several times per week, I will bring you epic guests, solo episodes, and every single tool, trick, and skill set you need to grow your business, grow your money mindset, and to grow your wealth to levels that you have never reached before. I've ended up in a unique place in life where I've got the experience, the connections, and all of the secrets that it takes to be successful. And I'm lifting the curtain to reveal it all to you in an effort to help put you in a position of abundance so great that you can then be as generous as possible. So let's lock arms and let's get started. Hey, everybody, welcome back to The Chris Harder Show, where we absolutely believe that both prosperity and generosity can and must coexist. You're in for a real treat today because I'm going to sit down with my friend, Keith Yaki. Now, Keith has kind of lived two different, very successful lives. I would say in the first go round, he was one of the most successful real estate investors and home flippers that you've ever known. Get this. He went from not knowing what he was doing to flipping two hundred homes in his first two years in business during the recession in 08 and 09. Let that sink in. When everybody else was losing their homes and everyone else was saying, stay away from real estate, this man said, I'm getting in. I'm going where everybody else is running from. And it changed his life. And he learned that he could use other people's money to build his dreams and create great returns for their dreams. So we're going to make sure that we touch on how to raise other people's money, how you can use it for your dreams, and how it's a win-win for absolutely everybody. And then he had another wake-up call a little bit later in his life when his wife of four years told him on FaceTime that she was going to leave him just as they were moving in to their brand new dream home. And he thought, this is impossible. I thought I was a good provider. And we do a deep dive on the difference between being caught up in your business and forgetting about the things that really, really matter and how you can balance both and how you can be far more attractive to your significant other. I think you're going to love his answer as to how to be far more attractive to your significant other and make sure that you keep your relationship a priority. So I know that we are all hard-driven entrepreneurs on here. And we can all, you know, chase the trophy. But we've got to remember that the most amazing prizes are the ones at home. And that's what makes this episode so incredibly important. Now, you also know that just like Keith has been on stages with Pitbull and Gary Vee, Russell Brunson, Lewis Howes, you name it. That is also the kind of network that I have and that Lori has. And we're doing something very special. We're creating an opportunity for you to network at a very intimate dinner with Lori and I and another dear, dear couple that we are best friends with. And we're inviting you to dinner for charity. You've already heard this if you listen to our He Said, She Said episodes, but we're inviting you to come have an intimate dinner in Scottsdale, incredibly high end, where 100% of the proceeds go to helping leukemia research. And not only do 100% of the proceeds of this incredible experience go towards leukemia research, but this is an opportunity for you to network the way that we have networked in incredibly high-end rooms. If you want to join this dinner, it's $15,000 per couple or per attendee. And all you have to do is text the word DINNER to 310 421-0416. You can imagine the high-level thinkers and the accomplished individuals that'll be in a room like this. And we're going to do intentional networking and we're going to put on an incredible experience so that we can not only do good at the same time as creating an even more incredible network that will help you do even more good in the future. You can't miss an opportunity like this. If you have the means, if you have the ability, come join us for this incredible dinner. 
by texting DINNER to 310-421-0416. All right, guys, get ready, listen up, take some notes, because this episode is all about protecting the most important thing you have at home, and that is your relationships. Keith, my friend, welcome to the show. How you doing, man? I'm stoked to be here, man. Doing great today. I should have said my new friend. I mean, we only met, what, was that two months ago already? Yeah, about that, yeah. We got sat next to each other at a dinner, and you were just an awesome dude from the start. So super glad we could make this happen. Thank you, man. Yeah, I liked you and Lori's energy a lot as well. Oh, I appreciate that. So listen, here's where I want to start. Obviously, when I started digging into you and, and when I knew I wanted to have you on the show, I, I was looking for some really cool moments in your life. And I came across a moment, I think it was in a video, where I heard you say that you believe that people can be going down one path and suddenly switch towards a much better one. And this first happened to you when you were around 28 years old. Do you want to take us back there and tell us about that? Yeah, man, that was uh, at 28. That was when my mom passed away. And uh, something happens to you when you see somebody that you love dearly die early in their life and early in your life. So I was only 28. She was only 56. And she said something to me basically on her deathbed. I spent pretty much the last few months with her in hospice. She had her hospice bed set up in like her favorite room of her house. And it was basically like the doctor was like, listen, we, we ain't do anything for you. So we might as well just be comfortable and enjoy the last piece of this life. And so when I went out there, my mom was like really incessantly pushing me, keep, man, this life is short and I'm dying with regrets. So don't die with regrets. I'm begging you, whatever's in your heart, go do this because it can go away like that. Like she had the presence of mind to, to, and that really stuck with me. It's actually why I went and started my business. It's, it changed everything. So that was the moment. So let's dig into that a little bit more. Did she share any of the regrets that she had or did she just say in general that she she's dying with regrets? The word she used was, I didn't become the person I wanted to become. Wow. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I, I interpreted it for me, myself. Like I always wanted to own a business and be free and I, I had it at that point. I was a pastor at that time and I had just stopped being a pastor. And so I was kind of figuring out what did I wanted to do next, even though I had owned some businesses while I was a pastor, like construction business, stuff like that. It wasn't like what I wanted to do. She said, I didn't go to the places I wanted to go, meaning she had travel plans that she didn't make. And I related with that. And I didn't become the person I want to become. I didn't do the, uh, the things I wanted to do. Those were the two things that she was like really like incessant on. It's crazy what can happen for you. And I don't wish that anyone ever goes through moments like this, right? Losing a loved one, yeah. losing a parent is, is one of the hardest things to go through. I lost my dad about a year and a half ago, totally unexpectedly. Mm. And didn't get to have any of those last conversations, so to speak. But he was very much a man that lived life to its fullest and led mm. by example. And when mm. he passed away, I had the same moment, but for different, re opposite reasons. I had the same mm. moment saying, why aren't I living even more life? Why aren't I doing things necessarily as, as joyfully as dad does them? It's a funny mm. thing. My dad never, ever complained. Like I can't name a time that he complained. Neither can Lori. It's the craziest thing. Wow. And I complained quite a bit. And I took that moment to say, if I complain quite a bit, that must mean that I'm not living the life in the way that somebody who does not complain at all would live their life. And it was a good mm. sobering moment for me, the way it sounds like this was a good sobering moment for you. So what was this next step for you? Mom passes away and you've got this realization that where she says, hey, I've got regrets. I don't want you to have these two, Keith. What was the next step? What was the next action? What did you know that you had to do? I wanted to start a business in real estate, and I always thought it would be massively confusing. And I always thought you had to have money to be able to buy real estate because you do have to have money, except it doesn't have to be yours. And I didn't know that. And so one of the things I would do with her is I would lay in bed with her at night and she would watch these reality TV shows where they're flipping houses. Sure. They were kind of new back then. So this was 2007, six, six, seven or eight, somewhere right in there. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it was, feels like a hundred years ago. The whole genre of flipping homes though. I know exactly. It was pretty new about then. It was really new. There was a really polarizing figure on there. And my mom knew I was really very handy. I'd built houses, my own house at 22 years old. I built from the ground up, dug the hole, did every single trade, had a couple of guys like older men that were working for me. So in Home Depot or not Home Depot, but the local Home Depot-ish type lumber yard would drop off the thing. They'd go to hand the bill them. They're like, no, it's, it's 22 year old kid over there. He's the boss. Uh -huh. And so 
I always wanted to do, I always wanted to like kind of flip houses and I was just always scared. Cause I'm like, I didn't know the words are long. I mean, I can barely still stay amortization. You know what I mean? Like, and I've raised in millions and millions of dollars and I still lend private money, but it was that time. I, it was so confusing. And we're watching this show and she turned to me and she was, Keith, you could do that. And I said, I would crush that guy on TV because he's a total asshole. <laughs> do you care to share and who it I, is? Yeah, yeah. It was it, Well, I don't want to say his oh, name yeah, because yeah, I don't want to give this guy credit because he turned out to be not that great of a human being after I got to really know him really well. But I, what I did was I said, well, if that guy can, my, my mind has kind of always been, I'm sure it's like yours. And a lot of dudes are like, if that guy can do it, then I can yeah. do it. And so I'm like, well, he's not good with people. And I've always been really great with people. So I'm like, I can do that. Once she passed, I was living in Las Vegas at the time. I was sitting by my fire. I was working construction. I was kind of in that low spot in my life. And I bought this dude's ebook for $99. And he said, if you don't have any money, there's people out there that actually want to lend you money on this stuff. And that one sentence, I paused and I thought, it was the one last chain link I needed to secure. And I just went after. And I actually hired that guy. He was in the information space at that point. I hired him. They made me believe I was one in 12 in the entire country that was going to you know, be personally mentored by this guy. And I'm like, I got to do it. I didn't have any money. So I asked my sister if I could borrow it. She believed in me. She's like, I believe in you. She lent me the money. And I went and flipped 200 houses within the next two years. It was like that thing. That's incredible. So for context, you said this was probably around 2007. You got the last couple years of homes flipping and selling before the recession hit. Is that right? It must have been the end of 2008, 2009, because everything started going down. Six months in the business is when like Lehman Brothers, like everything crashed. Six months into you starting to flip. Yeah. Okay. So I got a whole bunch of things I realized as you were talking. Number one, I realized the first time that you went and used other people's money to invest is when you went to your sister. How cool is that? Yeah, exactly. And then that turned into obviously getting other people's money in order to flip homes that you wanted. The very next thing that that kind of led me to was to start that when everybody else was losing their homes, to start that when everybody was all of a sudden saying, you know, home ownership and home building is dead. What was going through your mind? Were you confident? Did you know you were different or were you scared out of your mind? That is such a powerful question because you know what? All I did was believe that my mentor said, he said this one thing. Nordstrom goods are now on sale at Walmart prices. Ooh. And he had another phrase. This, this guy was smart. He ended up, I mean, he's not a good dude, but he was business savvy, smart. He said, we're like firemen. When everybody's running out of the building, we run in. And so I literally fixed my identity in my head that I'm what this guy says we are. So when everybody else is running out, I was like, well, of course I'm running in. And it was sheer faith and belief in my mentor. Wow. And you said, he said that would happen. You said 200 homes that you flipped in how long? In, two, in my first two years. You know, I've probably flipped around seven or 800 now and owned hundreds of rental units. But it was in that first two years where I just went all in. Looking back, it's actually miraculous timing, right? If you can buy and, and scoop everything up at the bottom, then you have nothing but appreciation ahead of you. So, I've got to ask you, people are hearing this right now and whether they want to flip homes or whether they have a different kind of business they want to do, they've got two questions on their mind. The first question is, what in the hell is the first step to going and raising money? I think I saw somewhere that you raised over $50 million at one point. And the second question that they're probably thinking is, how the hell do you go from just starting to doing 200 homes in two years time? Because I'm Superman. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't feel like Superman at the time. I knew construction really, really well. And I knew you could sell properties by giving it to a realtor. So I feel like those two things are like, well, duh. And I had done tons of remodels, tons of stuff. So I just figured if I could find the properties and if I could get the money, I would be able to do it. So my first time talking with was hard money lenders and then mixing it with private money lenders. So A hard money lender would lend me almost all of it. I would just need some down payment and kind of get the construction rolling before they would do the draws. And so I had on the job site contractors that worked for us that really liked me. And I said, hey, I've got some opportunities to do this home, this home, this home. I'll give you 50% on your money. Like if you lend me 30 grand, I'll give you 45 grand back in like the next six months. And they're like, sure. And it all came down to the same thing my sister said. She goes, you're trustworthy. I believe in you. And that's what it really took. And what was interesting is I got a deal accepted and I went to go put the, uh, the earnest money deposit. I didn't have it. And my brother, I love him, but he's a wild, crazy man. And he called my sister who we were going to get the initial money from. 
She sent him the earnest money deposit and he went and blew it on strippers and cocaine. Come the on. Night. I swear to God. I swear to God. So I show up, I get off my construction job during lunch to go over to the bank to get the money to put it in my account so I can give it to the realtor. And he goes, looks me dead in the eye and he goes, I don't have it. I'm like, what do you mean? Now, mind you, at this point, I had three little kids. I was working this construction job like seven days a week, 12 hours a day, hating my life. And I'm like, I'm doing everything I can to get out of this. And I finally got my first deal accepted, my offer. And this is what happened. He says, he goes, dude, I don't have it. I go, what do you mean? He goes, I spent it on strippers on cocaine last night. What'd you, anger, furious, yeah. flip out? Yeah, I said, if you were my brother, I would knock you on this pavement right now. I said, and I can't talk to you. I can't even look at your face. And I turned around and walked away. I was so dejected because I was so close. Yeah. Like, oh my God, right I'm right the there. Yeah, th- I got another offer accepted. And the dude who was going to put up the interest money crossed my name off the contract, took it for himself. This is the second one in a row. Second one in a row. Wow, okay, third- knock, knock down twice. What happens third time? Third time, I get a wholesale deal. I'm about ready to wholesale for 54K in my pocket, which was, I was only making about 75 or 80K as, as you know, doing the construction engineer thing. And the guy backs out the week before and I lost another five grand earnest money deposit. And this is going to sound a little theatrical and I'm okay with that, but this is true. This is what my mind said. I grew up playing football my whole life. And I'm like, I got one more down and I'm way closer to the goal line than I was when I started. I'm going to go, I'm going to go at this one more time. I landed three deals within like two or three weeks. I get two days before I'm going to fund the first one. I'd raised the money. I got everything ready. And a hard money lender backs out two days before I was supposed to close on my first one, which was the fourth deal. And I called my realtor. I go, dude, my money just backed out. He goes, hold on. I got a guy. He calls him. We meet the next day. He ends up funding that deal. And I went on and probably funded maybe a hundred deals with that same lender where he got to a point where he trusts me so much. He says, if you find any deals in this zip code, I will write you a check for fifty thousand dollars. I don't care how much you buy it for, how much you renovate it for, because I'm, he, you know, private money lenders are trying to put their money on the street. Yep. That's how they make their money. Yep. So that one person backing out and me meeting this other guy actually helped launch me to be able to go and have access to money very, very quickly. Fourth and short, you don't just score; like you score, right? Like yeah. that opens up a huge opportunity, huge doors for you. There's a lesson in there for so many people because they they probably would have quit after the first time. Maybe they'd pull themselves up a little bit and and then get knocked down that second time. For sure, most people are quitting there. Third yeah. time, I'm telling you, almost everybody's quitting. The lesson yeah. there is very simple to understand. Keep freaking going. Yeah, man. And you know what's interesting, Chris? I struggled because I was a pastor for a long time. I get a little personal here. I struggled with, you know, when I stopped going to church and I mean, I'm no longer the pastor and I don't even go to church anymore. I struggled for a long time thinking that my creator was mad at me. Oh. And about three years ago, I got a download from him and said, what if I'm not mad of you? What if I'm actually proud of you? And what if you are a personal representation of some of humanity's greatest qualities? Because Keith, you have grit, you never give up and you keep pushing to get what you want. And those stories actually came back into my mind three years ago about how I didn't give up and it's changed my entire life because I didn't. Yeah, and, and now you're still preaching them today, so to speak, right? Probably yeah. A, an equal, if not more valuable message to a lot of people. So I want to fast forward a little bit because okay. we opened up with this quote that I heard you say where you believe that people can be going down one path and suddenly go towards a much, much better one. You had a second moment in life where you were going down a path, a uh, not so favorable path in your marriage and yep. your wife left you. And yep. once again, you somehow ended up on a sudden, much more favorable <laughs> path. Take us to that moment. What happened? Hey, let's clarify a couple of things. When that one path ends and I'm going to the other one, it looks rocky as hell and it looks dark and it looks dreary, but I stepped into it anyway and it ended up being a path. So, cause, cause I don't want anybody to think, oh, well, well that path looks amazing. And then it was easy. No, it actually seemed way harder than the path I was on. That's and, and you know that. I'm so glad that you clarified that. I hope everybody caught that. It wasn't like you got off one smooth highway and said, well, that other smooth highway looks good. The other one looked like a shit dirt road to nowhere. And it felt like it. And I sat in it for a while. So this was five and a half years ago. And this radically changed my life as well. My wife, we'd been together for four and a half years at that point, And she goes, 
via FaceTime. We're moving into our dream house in Las Vegas. And she says, I was at a mastermind with some buddies you probably know, David Falk and some other guys. She sends me a FaceTime and she says, Keith, I'm going to help you move in, but I'm not staying. Wow. We're done. Well, out of the blue, you had no hunch. No hunch. Wow. No hunch. What was your and, first thought? Uh, what? That was my first thought. Huh? What? what? Like shock. Like, huh? Wait. I had just sent like videos to my kids because I was like wanting, I just was telling them how much I love them. So I was in this major love feel. I'd already sent videos and then she FaceTimed me after I sent the video. So I'm like kind of on a high. And then I get that. And I was just like, oh, my first question was, is there another guy? She said, no, you're just not the guy for me anymore because you run your business. You come home and talk about your business and you fall asleep on the couch. And I've been asking you for years to knock that off. We want you. We want you. Your head's somewhere else. So it hit me blindsided, but telltale signs were there when I look back at it now. This is one fascinating, two, a great wake-up call for so many people listening right now that are in relationship or, or about to get into one. So I really want to unpack it. Okay. When she said via FaceTime for crying out loud, hey, I'm going to help yeah. you move in to our dream home. Dream home. And it, I'm not talking like kind of nice home. It, it was gorgeous by any standards. Yeah. And you were sh obviously shocked. You said that you, you couldn't even comprehend what she was saying. Had you thought you were being a great husband and a great provider up until that very moment? I thought I was a great provider. And I thought that equaled great husband. And I realized apparently that wasn't the case. You know what's interesting? So uh, I was in banking right up until the recession hit. Same thing, young, arrogant, ignorant, chasing down my career. It was what mattered most on the road all the time, chasing down promotions. And I thought I was being a great provider. Well, I'd pick Lori up, move her to a new town every year, sometimes twice a year when I'd get a promotion and say, hey, pick out a house, make a life. You should be happy. Yeah. And then when we lost everything, I see that as a massive blessing, probably different than someone saying, hey, peace, I'm out of here. But a different version of that same kind of interruption saying, hey, this is not being a great partner. This yeah. is doing what you want to do and not asking what the other person wants to do. So what the hell did you do? Did you just accept so, it? Did you move on? Dude, I cried. I would go to the gym for like six hours a day. I would go do my workout. I would swim. I would sit in the sauna. I would cry. I would do laps upstairs. I'd go back and try and do chat. I mean, it, I was a total mess because at that point, I had been with a lot of women and I had finally found the one that I wanted to keep. And so getting a new woman, what that's not hard. That wasn't, I had learned that skill. I'd become that guy. And it was like, man, the one I really wanted. Oh my gosh. And the light bulb, that was when the light bulb went on immediately for me. And I'm like, I'm 95% at fault. Wow. This is on me. And when I say the light bulb went on, it was like you're in a room and you're feeling around and you're like, oh, there's all this dirty laundry. Why won't people pick up their dirty laundry? And then the light goes on. You're like, oh, it's mine. Specifically, which part was your fault? Like really unpack that for us. I didn't spend a lot of time with her. First of all, she said I wasn't a good parent. She goes, dude, I feel like a single parent. You're such a bad dad that I literally don't even want another kid with you. Wow. Number one. And I had already three other kids. I've got older kids from a previous marriage and I was a pretty decent dad, but I was, it was a different season of my life. This time I was, I'm going after it, man. I, we're making millions. We're crushing. We're, you know, we're doing this. And I sacrificed my family at that altar. So she goes, you're, you're not a great dad. Like you barely see your daughter. She goes, I don't even want to leave him for girls night out or leave her for girls night out because you're such a horrible dad. I don't know if you're going to be able to take care of her or not, which was super humiliating. <laughs> now she leaves for a week, a whole weekend. And me and my daughter are like, peace. See, and she doesn't even think about it. She doesn't even have to check in if she doesn't want to, because she knows we're good. Yeah. Secondly, I was a horrible partner. Like she just was like, dude, I feel alone. I feel alone. Like I want your attention. I want, I stopped having fun. When she met me, I was in full player mode. You know what I mean? I wasn't supposed to get married. I wasn't looking for the gal of my dreams. I, she ran into me and I was like, oh, we can party. We'll have a good time. And then I was like, dang, dude, if I was actually going to get married, you would be the girl I'd want to do that with. And so that's, that's how we led down to doing that. I just realized she didn't feel like a priority to me in any way, shape, or form. And she literally said, cute house, nice cars. I never even cared about any of that. All I wanted was you. So she breaks this bombshell on you. You figure out, wow, she's right. I really wasn't present. I wasn't giving her what she needed. 
what are the signs? How would you have known if you could go back and coach your earlier self? Because people are busy, right? They're literally just trying to get by day by day, trying to provide for their family. So what signs would they be able to recognize? I would say intimacy is the one that is usually the last to go. Because a lot of women are feeling, wanting to feel dutiful as a good wife. And so they'll give sex to their husband and they'll, they'll do those types of things. But I always look at like the intimacy and connection and sex is like the root. It's the very last thing hanging off the end of the tree. And so when everything else gets shriveled up, eventually the fruit just dries up and falls to the ground. Mm-hmm. The three things I look for is, does she initiate? Does she enthusiastically participate while you're having sex? Or is she more into the spreadsheets than she is the bed sheets? <laughs> and it's, it's, so those are the three things I look for. And those are the three things that guys usually struggle with who end up eventually coming and talking to me about helping them in their relationship. But so those are the three things. It's like, if she's no longer like really saying how much she loves you and, and caring about your love language in any way, shape or form, she's checked out. And dude, the stat, this was the big one for me. Most women have planned their exit one to two years in advance. Wow. So they're just sticking around, barely hanging on for a year to two. I think it's because they have a lot of hope in the romance. They want the relationship to work. And in our society, most women, not all, but a lot of women are dependent on their husband for finances. And so they're trying to figure out what's the exit plan. And I think for Jessie, she she goes, I don't even care if I have nothing it's better than being with you. In so many words, this is what she said, Chris, that really stung, man. She's good with words. And this is what she said. She goes, my life would be better without you in it. Okay, so you gave us the signs to watch for. How did you go about rectifying this? So I had learned, if I want to get my body in shape, I hired a trainer. And that's what I did to learn how to get in shape. If I want to learn how to build a business in real estate, I hired a coach. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, I've got to figure out. So I went to YouTube and I watched every how to get your ex back video possible. The three coaches I kind of resonate with, I hired all of them the same exact time. And I'm like, I want a different perspective. Hiring a coach is the way to see something that you can't see yourself. It's how you see blind spots. The old saying, you can't read the label from inside the bottle. I knew all of that. And I'm like, okay, I hired these three coaches to learn how to get her back. And it worked. But here's what I never believed, Chris, is I never actually believed they actually went through what I went through. They had the right theories and psychology, but I never thought, I'm like, dude, this pain is so real and so raw. It's the the nerve is just like you barely even breathe on it and it's excruciating. But I never sensed that from them. And even when I talk about it to this day, it's like I use vivid imagination. It's not even imagination. It's vivid details because I went through it. Like I would sit and cry for hours. Dan Martell was through me this entire season. Pete Vargas was with me this entire season. And I would just call and go, can I cry for like 20 minutes and tell you how horrible I am feeling? And they're like, no problem, let's go. So you work with three coaches. By the way, do you recommend that? Should people have more than one coach at a time? I don't know, dude. When you're at that point, you're so desperate. I would have hired 30 if that's what I knew what the answer is. I wanted a different perspective. One of them was a female. One of them was a male and another one. There was two males and two females. And they seemed to have different ideologies, but they had some, there was some things that they would say that I'm like, oh, that's good. And they kind of blended together. So they, they weren't totally divergent. If somebody's trying to train like physically, probably not a good idea. Okay. All right. So you mean trying to coach you on your, your relationship physically? <laughs> yeah. What was the first piece of advice that they gave you that you actually took? Like, how did you rebuild this? Because I would prefer people to be able to avoid this to begin with, right? That's why we gave them the signs. But let's give them the steps to if they're listening right now and they say, holy shit, I might be in trouble. What yeah. are the steps that you took? Well, I'd like to add one piece of context. Most guys know, they don't know it, but they know the signs. Once those, like those three signs doesn't initiate, doesn't enthusiastically participate, it cares more about the spreadsheets and the bed sheets. They're aware of those symptoms immediately because sex is the thing that a lot of us guys look as a, a tally score or a, hey, how are we doing in our relationship? It doesn't actually mean we're having a great relationship because women can fake it and they can just go, hey, I know he needs it. And some women just like, I need sex too, but I don't like the guy. Yeah. And so that's usually a telltale sign that things that she's already checked out, even if she hasn't left. So it could be a fake scoreboard. Yeah. Yeah. But so here's what happened is this is what I learned from those three people. If I'm going to move on, 
I need to move on. I need to get over her. And if I want her back, I need to move on and get over her. Wow. And now having taught a lot of guys in the same process of getting their ex back, it's true. And, and my football playing brain <laughs> said this, that's one play. That's only one. That's half back off tackle every play. Okay. I can run that. And so, and the reason the psychology of this is a woman never wants to come back to the same relationship. No, nope. That's why she left. So she's saying, I'll come back if you're new, the situation's new, and we're coming to a new relationship. But there's no way to have a new relationship if you're not a new guy. Interesting. It makes great sense now. If you're going to move on, you got to change. If you're going to stay, if you want to try and get her back, you got to change because nobody wants to come back to the situation they just left. Exactly. And that, I was like, oh, that's why I realized, wait a second. This all has to do with attraction. She's no longer attracting. In fact, she's repelled. And a lot of times people think attraction is like biceps, abs, and, and sex. It's not always that. It's Attraction is simply this. I'm leaning in. I want to hear more. Oh. Repelled is, oh my God, I got to roll my eyes and get away from this guy as fast as possible. So attraction means to pull in. Repel means to move away from. So a lot of guys, even though their wife hasn't quote unquote left, she's no longer attracted to him. So I realized this, and this is, this is my playbook now that I teach guys. You have to become the most attractive version of you. And the most attractive version of you loves themselves. And when you love yourself, you go, hey, if she comes back, great. If she doesn't, wasn't meant to be because I love me. It's so fascinating because you really do have to become that best version of yourself to be attractive. Yeah. And it can't be dependent on that other person. It has nope. to be you solely. Here's the best package I am. And if you like it, great. If you don't, that's okay too. And that's hard for people to understand. That's scary for people. In our society who is clamoring for likes, and comments and buddies and DMs and please tell me you like me because I don't like myself. It's almost impossible. Give us real steps to liking ourselves better. Okay. This is the only step, the only one I know. And again, maybe I'm sound like the one play in my playbook guy, but that's how simple I yeah, am. I kind of like it. Simplicity works. But this is what works for me. Do what you say you're gonna do in the time frame you say you're gonna do it every single time. And the reason why that will get you to love yourself is because you now have proof that you keep your word to yourself. It's overly simplistic, but it's the only thing I've found that actually is not faked. It's not feigned. It's I'm going to get up at 530. I don't get up at 531. I get up at 530 and I go do the hard thing that I don't want to do, but I do it and I go, I did that. And then you fall back in love with yourself. And I can tell you the day I fell in love with myself. I was in Las Vegas, October 25th of just this last year. That's how long it took me to fall in love with myself Jeez. at 42. Wow. And I started 75 hard on October 4th. It's the second time I'd done it. And there's a certain thing you have to do every single day. And I decided I'm going to pick it in the hardest season possible. My 10 year anniversary, although there was a breakup in there and the divorce and all that. Not, we didn't fully divorce, but it was separated. My 10 year anniversary, Halloween, my birthday, which is always a shindig with me and my friends at my house, Thanksgiving. I picked the hardest 75 days I could because at first I was like, oh, I can't do that. I was like, no, you need to do that because you have an excuse or you have a reason, which reason is really just another word for an excuse and excuses don't work if you're going to fall in love with yourself. So, and I was traveling to five different cities to do stand up comedy with my good buddy, Garrett Gunderson. Jeez. So I go to Vegas, I go downstairs to work out in the Aria Hotel after a night of doing comedy and having, I was out late, but I did my 75 hard thing, so it's okay. I was out late having a good time, didn't drink, didn't do any of that stuff, just had a really great time. I wake up, I go downstairs to work out and they tell me I have to wear a mask. I said, I'm not wearing a mask, mm -hmm. but I'm in indoor clothes and it's 37 degrees outdoors in Las Vegas, but I have to get my workout in. This is the only time I can do it. So I go outside, I'm wearing my short shorts and like a thin little Lululemon sweater and I start running and I'm running. I was staying at the Aria. I'm running in front of the Bellagio and there's these bums out in front of the Bellagio that early. It was like 637, sun just barely coming up and they go, oh, crazy white boy, don't you know it's cold? <laughs> and this is my reflex. I turned to them when I'm running. I said, not in here. It's not. Wow. And I kept running and I was like this. I said that. Wow. I said, 
I get back from my run. I go up to the hotel. I go into the bathroom and I look in the mirror and I say these three things. It's the first time I've ever said I'm in mental. I love you. I trust you. And I believe you can do anything. Oh, I love it. And it was that. all because I kept my word for only three weeks at that point. Three weeks in the midst of a lot of temptation. I'm like, doesn't matter. That's not more important than me loving me and me becoming the best version of me. Now, I had already had Jesse came back five years ago, radically in love with me, super healthy sex life. Everything's we're radically in love like never before. But it was me finally loving me. And it was simply doing exactly what I said I would do. No compromise, zero modifications, zero excuses. You either do it or you don't. When you do it, it means you love yourself. It's powerful because anybody can do that. And you did it when the odds were stacked against you, right? So many of us would be guilty of saying, ah, it's not a good time to start. I'm going to start later, right? When I don't have all these things. And so I feel like there's two very important messages here. One, if you're serious about this, you got to start right now, right? You got to start keeping your word right now. Two, it's not going to take as long as you think to start loving yourself and therefore be lovable by other people. Yep. And when you love yourself, it doesn't matter if they love you. Because if they don't, oh my gosh, they're missing out on something beautiful. I tell people at the gym all the time, I'm like, I show my abs off in the mirror because the lighting's good. I'm like, I'm super chiseled today, right? And I don't care if anybody's looking like, oh, I don't think I'm egotistical. I don't think because I love myself. I've worked so hard to be ripped. Yeah. And I love it because I didn't put the work in for them. I didn't say to anybody I was doing 75 hard on social media, none of it, because it wasn't for anybody. It was for me. I learned to play for the audience and the respect of one person, myself. And it's what drives me to this day. It changed my life, Chris. And I feel like a, my business, married game, teaching guys how to get their wives to have sex with them. I feel, I call it the gospel of married game. Sure. I feel like an evangelist to share this, but I feel like I'm teaching the gospel of like, what does it mean to just do what you say you're going to do? Like Americans, we're liars. Yeah. And it's okay. We just expect people to lie to us. And it's like, what if I stopped lying first to myself, then I would never feel the need to lie to anybody else ever. I don't care if you think I'm rich or I'm broke. It doesn't matter. Your opinion literally doesn't matter. Fascinating you say that. I just realized when you said that, boy, do we let other people off the hook and boy, do we let ourselves off the hook. Yeah. Like we are absolutely okay with a society of people keeping their word half of the time. Yeah. And no wonder yeah. then half of the relationships end up in divorce and it, it, more it than half of the businesses end up bankrupt because we yeah. just live in a society where it's okay for us to be uh, truthful with ourselves half the time and, and we let other people be truthful just half the time. We don't hold anyone to their word anymore. Yeah, man. I posted my before and after picture weeks after I finished 75. I was so embarrassed by the before picture, so embarrassed. And the guy who runs it, Andy Frazella, was like, you guys might be embarrassed, but you should post it because it would encourage other people. And I'm like, but I, I look at that picture a lot and I go, that was a man who didn't realize that he was lying to himself. Wow. That was a man. And it's, it, the, the pictures are extremely obvious. Like this was one dude was eating a lot of Chipotle burritos. And the other dude was not. I love it. I want to go back to one thing then to, to start to kind of put a bow on this thing. Okay. So people heard your message loud and clear. You got to be able to love yourself first before you're going to get back into this relationship and salvage it, right? Even if you don't think it's broken, if you suspect it's broken, better start working double time on loving yourself first. But they still have a family to provide for. They still have a business that's maybe booming or maybe struggling, but nonetheless needs their attention. What is your advice? for striking this balance between having a successful business and a successful relationship? What I discovered was this. It's really simple. When you do what you say you're going to do, you actually have way more time for everything. You don't fart around because you have to get super intentional. If you say, I'm going to be here, I'm going to be here, I'm going to be, be here. There is no slap. There's no slop. There's no time for this. There's no, I don't have time to scroll and, and look and like, dude, I spend max 15 minutes on social media at a certain part of the day. And other than that, I'm not in that world. I don't, I'm not going to live in that little box. No way. So most people are wasting so much time on looking at other people's lives, watching sports. They care about the stats of everybody else's life. What I would say is go all in on you, like actually care about your stat. What are you doing? What are you setting up for your day to look like and stick religiously to that? And don't worry about what, and if anybody, I could say so many things. I want to say this, Chris, I've told everybody, if you haven't met me October 4th, 
in person after October 4th, you don't know me. Wow. You know me because you met me after wow. that. So you know this guy. But October 3rd and before, wildly different human being. And it's not like I got more hours in the day. No. I just got more intentional on what I'm going to spend time on during the day. And I will not break my word to myself. You said something massive. I want to hope people caught this. When you start keeping your word to yourself, you end up with a lot more time to do the things that you want to do. It makes so much sense when you say it because you're not going back to, to do things three, four, five times or like you said, wasting your time because you said you were going to do one thing, but now you're scrolling social media. That's yeah. an incredible realization right there in itself. So where can people go if they want more of this? If they realize, hey, I might be in trouble and they want some coaching or they want some help or they want some tips, where should they go? If they want to watch a 30-minute video where I explain how your wife has lost attraction to you and how to get it back, they can go to my website, which is marriedgame.com. And I explain exactly, here's why she lost attraction. Here's how to get it back. And ultimately, sex is kind of the telltale sign for us guys. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of women listeners. I'm curious, what's the telltale sign if he's checked out and she's the hard-driven one? I'm going to tell you, I don't know, because I'm not a woman. I know we have women on here. So I would say go to Instagram because I do have a lot of free videos on there. And believe it or not, I have a lot of women that like them, comment on them and DM me about the content in there and will ask me questions in there. But here's what I want to say to the women listening. I know it's, a, it's a, a good segment of this audience and that's this. One of the things that the reason why Jesse eventually ended up having to say, hey, I'm done with this is she lost who she was in my big shadow. I've, I'm a big personality. I've always got something going on. I'm building a business or I'm building something. And she lost who she was in that. And she attached her identity to being my wife. And now I don't let that happen. I empower her to be as strong and as beautiful. And I always tell guys this, I know you want your wife to be a freak in the sheets, but, and a lady in the streets. I said, that's not real. I wanted to be a freak in the sheets and a freak in the streets, meaning I want her freak flag to fly. I want her to be so bold that she would go after anything she wants, do anything she wants, because she's not dimming my shine. Yeah. And she doesn't make me nervous by being the most powerful woman. I want that. I'm a leader to leaders, not a leader to followers. And if she is following my lead, I want her to be a leader and to lead herself. That would be the message I would tell a woman. Do not lose yourself and your husband. You're, you're powerful beyond notion and follow those inklings. Man, it's so spot on. Your relationship is guaranteed to be at its best point when you are both unapologetically being who you were meant to be, right? You're yes. your true self. I love that. Give me your yeah. website one more time. Marriedgame.com or at Keith Yaki on Instagram. Love it. Okay, so I've got one more question for you. You've yeah. been massively successful between real estate and, and now lending and, and, and your coaching brand. You have more than enough to go around. And our show's tagline is when good people make good money, they can do great things. Yeah. So what is something great that you've been able to do now that you've been so successful in life? I don't mean to sound coy or anything like this, but it has nothing to do with money I give or whatever. And I do, I'm very generous with my money to people and, and family and whoever, whatever. But I'd say the, the greatest thing I'm doing is living an example and telling others, it's the most simple one string on my guitar I keep playing. And that is, I tell it to my sons, 23 and 21 years old. If you can master honoring your own word, that's it. And so I'm giving an example. And I, when I say an example, I literally mean this, follow my exact footsteps. Follow, if I go right, you go right. If, you, if I go left, you go left. Do that for long enough. You'll learn how to go right and left by yourself and you'll get exactly everything you want. It might not be as fast as quote unquote, you think I got it, even though it took forever. <laughs> that's what it is. I'm, and I'm empowering people saying, look at here's the fat Keith. Here's ripped and chiseled Keith. Here's broke poor Keith. Here's rich Keith. All it is was a decision and I will spend time with people. And I think time is my second most important asset. And I give that away to people. Here's divorced Keith. Here's happily married Keith. That's thriving. Yeah. I love it. Keith yes. Jackie, thanks a million for being on the show. Seriously, wow. such an important topic for so many hard driven people that can easily get distracted. You're bringing what's important back into focus. So don't ever let up. Don't ever take your foot off the gas pedal, man. Thanks for doing what you do. I appreciate having you on. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds 
and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success. 